Okay, guys, I'm going to ask you some things you might be thankful for. Do you have something you're thankful for, Bryson, that you'd like to say in the microphone? Mommy. Your mommy? Good job. <laughs> All right, Catherine. Um, uh, my job, uh, my Sydney. Oh, okay. Lily? God and my family. Okay, great. Food. Food. Good job. <laughs> okay, one of the things that I know they are thankful for is the many, many people in this congregation who give of their time week after week to stay with them in the preschool area during worship or during Sunday school. And if you volunteer in any of those areas, would you please stand and remain standing because the children have a little gift for you. So please stand up. Go get, your, go get the gifts and hand them out. Praise the Lord. Thank you, choir, for that. That beautiful Thanksgiving song. We'd love to do that in our in a worship service at some point. And as a congregational, we just did it in a worship service, didn't we? And as a congregational, you know, that's such a beautiful, beautiful song. Um, we are going to be looking at Matthew 12, 1 through 8 this morning. You're going to be opening your Bibles to that passage of Scripture. Judy just read the. Um, the passage for us, and we're going to be uh, looking into that more carefully in the moments to come. Let's go to the Lord together. Prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for all that we've experienced already this morning. We know the presence of your Holy Spirit is here with us, in us, in this very place. God, we pray that you would have free reign in our hearts, that we would be transparent and honest with ourselves, with you, with one another. Open our eyes the blessings that you bestowed upon us. Most of all, the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his word. We ask now your blessings upon the reading of it, the preaching of it, and the hearing of it. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. I was going to college. I worked for United Parcel Service. I worked there five years. I was in a union. I was a teamster. I had a card. I was a card-carrying teamster. They took $17 out of my paycheck every week for union dues. I don't have a comment about unions. I'm not preaching about unions this morning. But some of my fellow workers spent more of their time, more of their effort studying union rules than doing their jobs. <laughs> some of them were so caught up in knowing the rules that they failed to do their job. Legalism is like that. Legalism can cause us to miss the forest, if you will, for the trees. Last time we, we saw the humanity of Christ and the deity of Christ in the same passage. In his humanity, Jesus was tired and frustrated and discouraged and, and yes, angry. In his deity, he was and He is in total control. And He invited us to come to Him 
and rest. Well, in this passage, Jesus defined rest, what it means. And in doing so, he refused to honor the Pharisees' interpretation of rest or the Sabbath law. You see, God is more interested in meeting people's needs than He is in protecting or perpetuating religious tradition. And that's what we find in this passage. So what can we learn about the Sabbath this morning? We're going to look at three truths about the intent of the Sabbath in this passage this morning. First of all, let's look at the Sabbath law. The Sabbath law. This is technical, so stay with me. We'll be in the Old Testament, in the Torah, a lot, as we look at the Sabbath law. Look at Matthew 12, verses 1 and 2. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and His disciples were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. So Jesus and his disciples were walking through a grain field when some of his disciples began to pick the heads off of wheat and eat. They wanted a whole grain field snack. (laughs) They were eating healthy. And according to the law, that was perfectly okay. Deuteronomy 23 and verse 25 says, And when you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the hedge with your hand, but you shall not use a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. Grain. It was acceptable to eat the grain, but you couldn't cut the stalks. But there's more to this story. They were not doing this on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday. They were doing this on the Sabbath. The Sabbath was a major point of contention and will be from here out. This passage is a powerful transition passage in the Gospel of Matthew. The Sabbath became a major point of contention between Jesus and the Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees added their laws to God's law to protect it. In essence, the Pharisees built a fence around God's law so that no one could get even close enough to God's law to break it. They meant well, but you just can't do that. How can we make God better? How can we improve upon God? How can we make His Word better? better. We can't. And nowhere is this more visible than with the Sabbath. The origin of the Sabbath, you'll remember, is Genesis chapter 2, verse 2. And on the seventh day, he ended his work on which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. But the Sabbath law did not come until the book of Exodus. Exodus 20 and verse 8, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. That, of course, is the fourth of the Ten Commandments. And the idea was that since God created everything in six days and rested on the seventh day, then the seventh day should be a a day of rest for us as well. We looked at rest. Last time, Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We looked at Hebrews 4, verses 9 and 10. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who rested, or for he who has entered his rest, has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. The concept of rest in Christian theology is this. Abiding in Christ. That's what rest is in Christianity. It's abiding in Jesus Christ. Rest and peace have similar meanings. So it's no accident that this passage about the Sabbath follows Jesus' invitation to rest. Rest is not just to stop working. Rest is to abide in the blessings of the Lord. Rest is, is peace in God. You ever been to a cemetery? We see this on tombstones all over. R-I-P. Rest in peace. But to the Jews, rest meant something else. To the Pharisees, I should say. Rest meant something else. Rest meant to observe the Sabbath. And again, their intentions were good, even biblical. Exodus 35 and verse 2. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh day shall be a holy day for you. A Sabbath of rest to the Lord. Listen to the last part of that verse. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. That's pretty powerful. It gets your attention. Breaking the Sabbath could cost you your life. The law goes on to give specifics for restrictions on the Sabbath. Exodus 35, 3 forbids the building of a fire on the Sabbath. Exodus 16, 29 forbids traveling on the Sabbath. Exodus 35, 31 forbids reaping on the Sabbath. But in every one of those instances, when you read the context, the emphasis is upon rest, not the stopping of work. And there's a difference. There's a difference. God's purpose for the Sabbath was to provide a day of rest so people could reflect upon their relationship with Him and worship and abide in Him. But the Pharisees stressed the restrictions instead of the rest. They misplaced the emphasis. They devised a list of 39 categories of work which was forbidden on the Sabbath. And in cases where they found a discrepancy with their understanding of the law, they just made up their own laws. They built a fence. For example, Exodus 16, 29 forbids traveling on the Sabbath. But Leviticus 23, 3 requires a holy convocation of people of the people of God on the Sabbath. So if God meant that no one could travel at all on the Sabbath, then how were they supposed to get together for convocation if they couldn't travel? How could they get to, go, how could they get to church if they couldn't travel? So the Pharisees, of course, knowing their Bibles, fixed that problem. They solved that problem by ruling that no one could walk more than 2,000 paces on the Sabbath. You see, in effect, they were claiming authority over the Bible. They were, claim, they were claiming authority over God's law by adding to it. I mean, who told them 2,000 paces is sufficient? Who are they to say 2,000 paces are sufficient? 
Exodus 35, 21 forbids reaping on the Sabbath. And Jesus and his disciples were picking grain and eating, and on the Sabbath they were reaping. At least his disciples were picking grain in a wheat field, and they were eating. Technically, they were breaking the Sabbath law. Technically, they could be put to death. You see, the Pharisees missed the intent of the law by being legalistic, by being overly technical. And over time, they placed more and more emphasis upon their commentary of the law than they did upon the law itself. They placed more emphasis upon the Talmud and the Mishnah than the Torah. That's the nature of legalism. Legalism makes us miss the forest for the trees. The bottom line of Sabbath law, of the Sabbath law, is that God intends for us to take one day per week and rest. Why? To invest in our relationship with Christ. To abide in Christ. And because Jesus Christ rose from the grave on the first day of the week, that's the day that Christians rest and worship. Our priority on Sundays should be rest and worship. That's why it's important for us to be in Sunday school on Sunday mornings. That's why it's important for us to be in church on Sundays for the purposes of worship. Well, secondly, let's look at a matter of priority. A matter of priority. Look at verses 3 through 7. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. But if you'd known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. So Jesus wanted the Pharisees to understand. He cared about them. He wanted them to to get it. He wanted them to understand the true meaning of the Sabbath. So he gave an illustration from Scripture to make his point. He used the Scripture, something they're very familiar with. He didn't argue from logic. He argued argued from the Scriptures. And in doing so, he implied the reason that they had a misunderstanding of the Sabbath law was because they didn't know that one hurt. Of course they've read. They were experts in the law. They knew the Bible frontwards and backwards. They knew their Bibles inside and out. But Jesus went on and he told them the story about when David ate the forbidden bread. He was talking about 1 Samuel 21. You can turn there or you can mark that as a note to go back and look at it later. He was talking about 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 through 6. Now David came to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech was afraid when he met David and said to him, Why are you alone? And no one is with you. So David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has ordered me on some business and said to me, Do not let anyone know anything about the business on which I send you or what I have commanded you. And I have directed my young men to such and such a place. Now, therefore, what have you on hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand or whatever can be found. And the priest answered David and said, There is no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have at least kept themselves from women. 
Then David answered the priest and said, Truly women have been kept from us for about three days since I came out. And the vessels of the young men are holy, and the bread is in effect common, even though it was consecrated in this vessel this day. So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread, which had been taken from before the Lord in order to put hot bread in its place on the day when it was taken away. You know the full story. You know the story. David is running for his life. He's running from Saul. And Saul is envious, and Saul wanted to kill David. So for 10 years, David ran from Saul. In this particular passage, 1 Samuel 21, is about when David and his men came to the village of Nod, where the tabernacle was at that particular time. The tabernacle, as you know, contained the holy place. In the holy place was the holy furniture. And upon the holy furniture sat the showbread. The showbread was 12 loaves of bread, symbolizing the 12 tribes of Israel, and they were baked as an offering for God. And they were replaced every Sabbath with fresh bread. The showbread was holy bread. And when it was replaced, the priest were allowed to eat the old bread, last Sabbath's bread. So David and his men were hungry, and he asked the high, David asked the high priest for some bread. But the only bread available was the showbread, which legally could not be eaten by anyone except the priest. Leviticus 24, 9 says the showbread was for Aaron and his sons. But Ahimelech gave David the showbread to eat. Now this event had to have happened on a Sunday, a Saturday. It had to have happened on the Sabbath because the bread was there. It was still there. The priest had not eaten it to this point. The new bread had been put in place and the old bread had been removed and the priest had not eaten it yet. It had to have been on the Sabbath. The point that Jesus was making was technically both David and the high priest broke the law of the Sabbath. And God didn't kill him. And God didn't kill him. Technically, David and the high priest broke the law and God allowed it. You see, here's the bottom line. God is more concerned about meeting needs of people than he is in keeping technicalities of the law. And Jesus' argument was if a human king and his men are able to eat the holy bread from the tabernacle on the Sabbath, then it must be all right for Jesus and his followers to eat a little grain from the fields on the Sabbath. David broke a law given by God through Moses. Jesus broke a man-made law made up by the Pharisees. The point is, the Pharisees had their priorities confused. This passage, by the way, indirectly strengthens the doctrine of the sanctity of human life. Because it teaches that to deny life-giving needs in the name of religious tradition is wrong. Human life is more valuable. God allowed David and his men to eat the showbread. But Jesus wasn't through. He referred to Numbers 28. Someone, Jesus pointed out, someone had to bake that bread. If new bread, if new bread is baked every Sabbath, then someone had to bake it. And of course, it was the priest that baked the bread. So technically, they were working, profaning the Sabbath. But what's really interesting is, is, is what Jesus said in verse 6. Matthew 12, 6, Yet I say to you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple. Jesus 
was saying that if the temple, if temple service justified the priest working on the Sabbath, then his service justifies his disciples because he is, is the temple of God. Jesus Christ is the tabernacle of God. He is the temple of God. The Pharisees were standing on holy ground and they didn't even know it. They were standing in the presence of the one who created the Sabbath. They were standing in the presence of the Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus said three things in this passage that reflects his anger, his frustration toward the Pharisees for misleading the people. This goes back to to help us understand better the outburst that Jesus had in chapter 11, 20 through 24. Ryan alluded to that last Sunday in his message. It helps us to understand that outburst. First of all, Jesus questioned the Pharisees' understanding of the Bible. That infuriated them. Second, he said, he's greater than the temple. That's impossible. And third, he said that he's Lord of the Sabbath. If the Pharisees were not mad before, they're furious now. They're furious. Then Jesus summed up the intent of the law by quoting Hosea 6. Hosea 6, 6, For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Interestingly, that's not the first time that Jesus quoted Hosea 6, 6 in the Gospel of Matthew. In Matthew 9, in verse 13, Jesus said, but go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. For I did not, call, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. It's mercy. It's the knowledge of God that pleases the Lord, not sacrifice. Certainly not legalism. Well, finally, let's look at Lord of the Sabbath, verse 8. Jesus said, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. The point of this whole passage is that Sabbath laws were made for man. Not man for the Sabbath laws. The purpose of the Sabbath was to provide a day of rest for people so they could reflect upon their relationship with God and draw closer to Him. The Sabbath is a gift. It's a gift from God to us. And it was never intended to restrict us, just the opposite. It was intended to give us freedom to worship Him. And as Judy prayed in her prayer earlier, praise God for our freedom in America that we take for granted. 47% of the people that live in Greenville County, 47% of the people that live in Greenville County are unchurched. I don't know, who knows? Half of them would claim that they're Christians. We have every freedom, every right to go and worship like we're doing here this morning. And so many people choose, make the choice to stay home or sleep in or sleep through Sunday school. Maybe come, maybe not. What a gift God has given to us. Jesus was more interested in the intent of the law than he was in the letter of the law. He said, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. When Jesus said that, he was clearly, without without any mistake, making a reference, another claim to his deity. Since Jesus Christ is God, and since God gave man the Sabbath, Jesus knows better than anyone else how it should be used. And it should never be used to hold us back. It should be used 
to give us the freedom to find rest and peace with God so that when we breathe our last breath, and that day is coming for you and for me, unless the Lord returns first, we can rest in peace, eternal peace. Jesus refused to abide by the Pharisees' legalistic approach to the Scriptures because God is more interested in meeting our needs than He is in protecting religious tradition. The Sabbath, or our Sunday, is to be a day of rest for the purpose of worship. In fact, Thanksgiving week is a kind of Sabbath. The Jewish festivals, their eight-day festivals, were counted as Sabbaths because they were a time of rest for the purpose of worship. Thanksgiving is a time to set aside the busyness of life, give thanks for our blessings, and draw closer to God. Reflect on that, this Thanksgiving. Many of us were set at a table with family and with friends. Make it your tra tradition, like it is our tradition, to go around the table and just take time and say what you're thankful for. We have so much. To be thankful. Rest so that we can abide in Christ. Just a few hours before Jesus died on Calvary's cross for your sins, for my sins, for the sins of the world, he said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this passage. Thank you for the message of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And God, may you make us to be good stewards of the Sabbath, of the rest that you give to us. That we would take it as a time to invest in our relationship with you, to reflect, to abide. To meditate on your word, to share it and discuss it. So that you might bear much fruit through us. Glorify yourself even today. In the name of Jesus we ask, amen. Amen. If you're here today, and there's never been a time in your life when you've asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and your Lord, this is your time. This is your time. You have an opportunity today to come to faith in Jesus Christ. Not everyone has that opportunity or will have that opportunity today, but we do. We can come to Christ in a public way, in a public manner. So you come. I will help you. Someone here will help you. 
come to a personal knowledge, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or maybe you are a Christian, and you know it without a doubt. But you also know that God is calling you to rededicate your life to him. You come. Maybe he's calling you to join this church. You come. However he's calling, we need to be obedient. We just need to do what our Lord calls us to do. So you come as the Lord calls. Richard, would you come and lead us, please? Stand, please.